There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. Brother John, just leap up here. Skip those steps. Yeah. Hey, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise and praise him like a seed right now. You sowed seed with your offering. Now praise him with a seed of Walsh up and praise him for victory. Praise him for victory. Praise him for your personal victory. Victory for the body of Christ, the salvation of souls, the revival that will hit America from coast to coast, border to border, to turn this nation upside right. Somebody praise him right now. Give him thanks for the victory. Give him thanks for the victory. Give him thanks. You know, I, I just want to give a real quick praise report before I go into this message. It's a very important message. How many of you saw the Facebooks and the Texas that came out of the services from here yesterday from the people that were in church? Anybody get a Facebook or a text? I don't get them. I, I don't get, I got envelopes on my phone and I don't even know how to pull up the envelope. So how many of you got a, a Facebook or a text? Let me see your hand. If you did, I said tonight was a matter of life and death, and it really truly is. We are all aware. We are all aware that ISIS is not going to take a second off. They're working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and their motives are clear. They have said that we are the great Satan, and they want to annihilate us in Israel. Make no mistake about it. My beef is ain't with those people. My beef is not even with, with the Persians or the Iranians. My beef is with the demonic spirits are that are behind them wanting to kill us. Make no mistake about it. The enemy will not rest until we are annihilated. However, we serve a God that says if we will do things his way, the battle's not ours, but the battle is the Lord's. That no weapon formed against us shall prosper. This revival service is a matter of life and death and I'm glad it's on link tonight. And I'm also glad that tomorrow night, tomorrow night's message will determine the future of every single human being on the planet Earth. Now, that's a pretty powerful message for 7 billion plus people. But the message tomorrow night will determine your future and my future. So you get the word out. Our season, our time is very short. And when the enemy is not taking time off, if demonic spirits, which do get weary, how do you know that? Because when they were cast out, what does it say, Brother Dale? That the demons look for a place to rest. God never rests, nor he grow weary. So we need to be active for God. How many want to be proactive? How many believe that if the enemy's people aren't resting, God's people oughtn't be resting? And we need to have a Holy Ghost revival, and we are. Now, I know it's hoiky joiky, but bear with me. I've got to say this. When I was with Brother Dale in March or April, I think it was April, I have not had a week off since because God has spoken to my wife and I, and she'll be with us tomorrow night. And we are determined. We, we know, how many of you know that there are a lot of good, powerful Bible scholars that, that, that believe that we're not going to get out of the month of October? There's a lot of Bible scholars out there that, that have a lot of DRs in front of their names and, and they're saying the rapture is going to take place because this Feast of Tabernacles and the blood moons and all the trumpets and everything, it hasn't happened this way in hundreds of years, ain't going to happen again in hundreds of years. So we know there's not going to be another occurrence of this. And so they're tying in with Joel, the moon shall be turned into blood. And I'm not debating that. In fact, I, I love the song they sang tonight. If, he, if the trumpet of God sounded right now, I'd be, this would be the best service of my life if the trumpet of God sounded right now. And I would go, and you'd be glad you gave him the offering. Wouldn't you be glad if the rapture took place right now? Wouldn't it be glad when the last things you did was give an offering so souls could get saved? Wouldn't you be thrilled about that? And then there's others that are saying this, Brother Dale. They're saying that there is going to be this, all these natural disasters which is clear as the nose in our face, it's not coincidental. It's, it's, it's not, I mean, you, Brother Gerald, you'd have, to, you'd have to be, you know, you'd have to be, you, you know what? I refuse and you refuse to be an ostrich Christian. 
I am not going to live with my head in the sand, ignoring everything going on around me. I'd much rather be an eagle Christian where I can fly up about five miles in the air and see for three or four miles everything that's going on in my environment. This is not doomsday. This is exciting news, saints of God. And there's others that are saying that God's judgment, that all these natural disasters are God warning America and the world for that matter, but particularly America, because outside Israel, we are the only nation that was birthed by God with a series of miracles like no other. And God birthed this country that 80% of all missionaries for the last 200 years have come out of this country. And all 90% of all foreign aid comes out of this country. And God birthed America so in part that we could protect Israel as a protector of Israel. And he has certainly blessed us. How many are glad that you were born American and not in some third world country? How many are grateful for that? I know it's hoiky joiky, but bear with me. But they say that these disasters are not really God's judgment, that it's localized judgment that God is using as a warning to, to get our attention that either we turn to God as a nation or the bad judgment is coming. I shared with you the other night that I believe that the prophecy of David Wilkerson was accurate and correct. I believe that God will have to judge this nation or he would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. He would have to apologize to the people of the flood of Noah. However, I believe that the Lord has spoken to me that if God's people will seek his face, that God will send a Holy Ghost revival and save as many people worldwide as possible before the rapture. And if God's people will take this hour seriously, God, I believe, has spoken to me, Brother Dale. That's why I haven't had a day off since I was at your choice and I was working before that. And, and the reason why is God spoke to me and said that the people of and the churches of America will seek my face. The judgment will still come upon America, but I will withhold it until after the rapture of the church. So guys, what we do is very, very important. And I am so glad tonight that I am preaching to the select, the chosen people that God has called to stir the pot, flan the fans, if you so speak, to bring revival to the land. How many believe that, our, that this is the best opportunity that the body of Christ has ever had to win souls? How many believe that the hours come where people are scared and are looking for answers? Aren't you glad that you're a part of something that is so big that at any moment the trumpet God could sound and the dead in Christ could rise and those of us which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air so guys that's where we're at right now I believe most of you know that how many believe the Lord's fixing to come back how many believe that we have precious little time to work with so I don't know if it's going to be the rapture I don't know if it's going to be terrible judgment all I know is what God put in my heart and so between now and Thanksgiving I won't have a day off to the week of Thanksgiving, and I had a wonderful Thanksgiving once with Brother Dale and his family. I will never forget that. And guys, I want to tell you something. I believe it's not too late. I do not believe it's too late for America to avoid the judgment. Why? Because if it was Brother Dale, you wouldn't be preaching repentance anymore. If it was Brother Tommy, you wouldn't be preaching repentance. I wouldn't be re preaching repentance. If it was too late and it was unavoidable, he'd just have us go ahead and preach that which the faithful need to hear to help them through it. Let me tell you what I'm saying. I'm thinking it's a possible. I'm believing that this is the beginning right here of something that's going to turn the entire state of Tennessee upside right with the glory of God. I believe what you guys are doing here at the Real Networks is going to take a whole of the whole southeastern part of the United States of America. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? I said that to say this. When I was here the, in April, the real east, and many of you supported that camp meeting. When I was with Brother Dale and Sister Teresa, they gave, the church gave generously. And because of that, I've been having stopped since. And I spoke last night how God in the month of August. Can you believe this? That God made it possible for a Pentecostal preacher to go into three high schools, two in Alabama, one in West Virginia, and preach the gospel and allow people to raise their hands 
and say the sinner's prayer. And because of the real networks, and I'm the American flag real voice of deliverance, 840 kids got saved in public schools in the month of August. In the month of August. In the month of August. Two of those schools were in a place called Sand Mountain, Alabama, and it's nicknamed Meth Mountain. So about half those kids are already on meth, and 840 of them got saved. Somebody shout hallelujah. Then in, in September, I was out at the Four Corner region, ministering on, in the Indian nation, the Native Americans, to the Navajos, to the Apache, to the Cherokee, the Root, all these different tribes. And God gave a tremendous revival and hundreds of Native Americans gave their lives to Jesus Christ. You see, because of the real network of which I've been a tithe paying member for several years now. Guys, I'm telling you, the rest is going to be the best. Now, for that to happen, we've got to be wise to the devil's devices. We must recognize the wiles of the devil. The word wiles means trickery. Wouldn't it be great anytime the devil showed up? Guys, I'm not, I don't want the devil to show up, and it's never great when he does, but I don't know about you, but there's not rarely a day that demonic warfare doesn't happen in my life. Now, I know I'm not fighting the devil poisonally because he's I'm not omnipresent, but I am battling one of his representatives. And wouldn't it be neat if a demon did show up and come against you and try to mess you up and trick you, that they show up in a red suit? Wouldn't it be neat, Brother Russell, if you went into court and that person sitting across the aisle, that, you know, the other bad guy and had a red suit and a, oh, some horns and a pitchfork. Wouldn't it be pretty easy to recognize that that's the devil and I'm going to rebuke that thing and bind that thing and get it out of my life. But that's not how the devil works. He works through deception. He works through wiles. That word wiles means trickery and deception. He is a master at trickery and deception of making people think that this is the right way when it's not the right way. And sometimes the horrible part of that is we don't recognize we went the wrong way till the storm comes. Because if you build your house on the wrong foundation, everything looks the same to the storm comes but only the houses that were built on the sure foundation will stand up when the storms of life come that's what this service is about and recently during a time of fasting I don't know why God he could have revealed this to much 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 better and more qualified men than myself but he revealed to me the number one way that the antichrist spirit and make no mistake about it saints the antichrist spirit has been at work for 2,000 years. The Apostle Paul makes mention of it 2,000 years ago. But as you study the Bible, you will find out the Antichrist spirit was working against the move of God before Jesus was even born in an earthen body. And we have to understand, everybody wave at me, this is a powerful message. In order to receive it, everybody raise your hand and say, I am a spirit, I am a spirit that has a soul that lives in a body. I am a spirit that has a soul that lives in a body. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's why I've got to get a new glorified body. But my spirit man has been born again and is perfect in God. However, my soul, which is my mind and my emotions. So how many found out your mind and your emotions ain't near saved as your spirit? <laughs> How many have ever found out that we really do need to crucify our flesh every day? Because if you let your flesh get one day of control, it is not a good thing. How many of you know what I'm talking about? But God revealed to me, the main, and guys, I want to explain this. And there are people who will say, Brother John, you're, you're, you're being political, or you're being judgmental, or you're being condemning. No, saints of God, I'm not. When a lie is told, the best way to expose a lie is present truth. And when you present the truth, then let the chips, so to speak, fall where they may. I, what I'm saying here is not condemnation because I was chief of all sinners saved by the grace and mercy of God. How many of you are saved by the grace and mercy of God? But you didn't get saved till you repented of your sin. You didn't get saved till you were convicted of your sin. 
You had to admit that you're wrong and say, I don't want to live like that anymore. And God coming to my life. And you had to ask forgiveness. Why did you do that? Because someone had the guts to preach you the truth and tell you the truth. And what's happened, Sister Teresa, in this political correct environment and the seeker friendly environment if you dare to stand up and say thus saith the lord people label you well you're judgmental or you're a hypocrite or or you're no no i'm just presenting the truth i don't know guys Guys, the Antichrist spirit is already at work as never before. Let me give you proof of that and give you a powerful message. Proof of that is, see, the Antichrist, if we're not careful, we think, Sister Kathy, that the only way the Antichrist spirit works is someone saying, I'm Christ when they're not. Or somebody saying, Christ wasn't the Son of God. Well, that's true, but it's much more complex than that. See, the Antichrist spirit's at work when someone gets up and says, God said this when God didn't say it. Or they manipulate the word of God to fit flesh and not spirit. Or they'll try to make the they'll try to make Jesus like us instead of us like Jesus. Now we're all a work in progress, and I have certainly not arrived yet but I know where I'm going. I want to be like Jesus. I want to look like him. I want to act like him. Now, now bear with me. I'm going somewhere. It's very important. The Antichrist spirit was very evident the day the Supreme Court, which I do not acknowledge them as Supreme Court. I acknowledge one Supreme Court. It's easy to know where it's at. If there's only going to be one judge, and it's going to be the judgment of Jesus Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. But the day that they pass the law, which they don't have the right to make law, but they broke the law, but never, never mind that. That's not the political. I'm not being political. But the day they did it, that very night, the White House was covered with a rainbow. Now, guys, I don't know about you, but like it or not, Charles Barkley several years ago said, I'm a basketball player. I'm not a role model. So don't act like me because I'm not paid to be a role model. That's true. I'm paid to be a basketball. But the president of the country is paid to be a role model. And the, listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying. I don't know how you felt as a parent or a grandparent when you're telling your child that that lifestyle is, a, is an abomination to God, and I'm not casting judgment. Guys, the act of homosexuality itself is a sin of the flesh. It can be forgiven of God, and God will forgive you, but he won't forgive you in your sins. He'll forgive you from me. He, he will rescue you from it. He'll change. How many of you can say you've been changed by God? And guys, then listen to what I'm saying. So I was angered in a spiritual way, and I was upset because what I've been telling my children and young people across the country, that that lifestyle is a horrible sin. But now the leader of the free world is saying, it's great. That was bad enough. The next day, Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter, a Baptist Sunday school teacher for over 50 years. He is a nuclear scientist. Do you know what that means? Guar education does not guarantee intelligence. A nuclear, that's right. A nuclear scientist got it. You're saying, Brother John, you're wrong for saying this. No, I'm not. Because young people are looking at this and are saying, who's right? Is the church right? Is God's word right? Is the Bible true? Or is the White House right? Listen, I'm saying. And Jimmy Carter said, as a born again, and he started, not me, as a born again Christian, as a Sunday school teacher, and he names the Baptist choice he was a Sunday school teacher at, that he believes that Jesus Christ would bless and condone gay marriage. Listen to what I'm saying. What are you trying to say? This is what's really scary. Both those men think they're right. Both those men think they're Christians. They say they are, but they can't. You can't be a Christian and be pro-abortion. If you got saved and you're still pro-choice, you need to get saved again. You need to pray through. 
And if you had an abortion, I'm not condemning you. I was chief of all sinners and live with the regret of my, this is not meant as condemnation. Guys, listen to me. When you get saved, God, and then the, what's happened is the Bible says if you don't deal with the antichrist spirit, what would it, does it lead to? Strong delusions. People become delusionary. Literally, like, a, like, like someone who's schizophrenic, delusionary. They believe that Jesus believes this stuff. That is the spirit of Antichrist. When it comes out and says that Jesus says something or Jesus supports something that he could not possibly said, could not possibly support, that is strong delusion and these men believe it. So God showed me something. He showed me the main way that the devil would attack the end time church. How many of you know that you're part of the revelation generation? Let me see your hands. It's going to be hoiky joiky, but bear with me. It's a matter of life and death. God showed me the main attack that the antichrist spirit would use against the body of Christ just prior to the rapture. Then he gave me solutions, and I'm going to have to take about 35 minutes more here, but bear with me because I'm tired, Sister Jeannie. I'm tired of going to churches and seeing kids commit suicide. I'm tired of having ministers call me up and say that they're not, I'm not tired of helping them, but they're actually contemplating taking their own lives. I am tired of, of people having to stay drugged up all the time just so they can. Now, guys, if your doctor gave you meds and if you stop taking meds, you're going to commit suicide don't stop taking your meds what i'm trying to say to you i think that meds are being over prescribed and what they're doing is they're, they're they're not helping the problem they're just numbing the problem they're just making you oblivious to it and what i'm saying to you saints there's an answer to this and i'm tired i'm guys i don't go every single week of my life every church i go to in the last year there's either been somebody associated that killed themselves somebody who came to me and said before this revival started i was wanting i was going to take my own life thank you brother john that cannot go on saints there's an answer to it we've got to deal with this and god showed me the main attack of the antichrist spirit against the body of christ so that he can prevent us from being prosperous and successful and and getting stuff done in these end times and of course i'm talking about the attack against the mind because if the devil can get you here He's done got your body. If the devil can get your mind, he's going to have your money. If the devil can get your mind, he'll get your marriage. If the devil can get your mind, he'll get your, your health. If the devil can get a hold of your mind, if he, the battlefield of the mind is where the victory is won or lost. But God spoke to me, Brother Dale, and that's why I haven't taken any time off because we've got to make the choice aware that God has a counterattack that will overcome this attack every single time. And make no mistake about it, God wants us to leave this world successful. God wants us to leave this world victorious. God wants us to leave this world achieving things for the kingdom. In Daniel 7, 25, now Daniel is one of the most powerful men of his time he is probably the most powerful spiritual man of his day and i believe daniel shows us the right way to oppose something the government does i don't believe in civil disobedience i don't believe gerald that we should go out and harm somebody that had an abortion or is performing an abortion we need to pray that they get saved i don't believe in civil disobedience but I also don't believe that the church is called to be silent and stand back and think that if we say something, then we're being judgmental or we're being critical. No, that's exactly what the Antichrist spirit would like you to think because he don't want the truth to be told. Why? Because the truth will expose the lie. And in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, Daniel won the most mightiest man of God that ever lived, certainly of his generation. He lives in a very hostile environment he does not live in a Christian nation. In fact, he is a slave in a pagan nation. But yet, he hears of a law. This law that's passed says that no man can pray to any God or any other man but the king. Think about that. Nobody can pray. The first thing Antichrist spirit will do is try to take away prayer, especially public prayer. Nobody can pray unless you pray to God or the king 
or you cannot pray to any God or any man. So what does Daniel do? Well, you know what Daniel did. He went out and started a riot. No, what Daniel did was he went, Dean, he went back to his house and the first thing he does is he throws open the windows. He ain't hiding in his prayer closet. He pops the windows open. And then just in case anybody don't know for sure what he's up to, the Bible says he drops to his knees and he goes to praying. Now he don't pray once a day. He don't pray twice a day. This guy's praying three times a day. So, you know, it's kind of hard to miss. And then the Bible says when he gets done praying, he worshiped God. So he prayed three times a day. Then he started, and I don't know, maybe he worshiped like the real bunch did tonight. Kind of hard to miss a guy praying three times a day and then worshiping God when he got done. So you know the story. He gets thrown in the lines, Dan, and God shuts the mouth of the lines. And then the people that were wicked in government got thrown in the lines then, and God opens the mouth of the lions. That's the way it goes. Same thing when they tried to burn the tree boys. They wouldn't bend, they wouldn't break, and baby, they wouldn't burn, and they got out of the fire, and then them guys said, never mind. Well, anyway, and so this revelation comes to Daniel right after he gets out of the lion's den. I think the revelation came to Daniel while he was in the lion's den. And this is what he said. And he shall speak. You read the verses just prior to this, and it is clear it's talking about the Antichrist. The Antichrist spirit was working hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Not the SMOs, not the Sunday morning onies, not, 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 not the non-committed, not, not, not the ones that, weren't, that aren't disciples. The Word of God describes them as saints. They're godly, saintly people. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. Do you see, it starts with words. Teaching changes thinking, thinking changes actions, Actions changes society. Hank, words matter. And he will speak great words against the Most High, such as Jimmy Carter did, such as some teaching does, such as if you preach anything that is convicting, you're condemning and you're judging. Why? Because the devil knows that godly sorrow worketh repentance. The devil knows when people hear the truth in love, it will convict them. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. So he'll speak just insane stuff against God himself and shall wear out the saints of the most high and think, think to change times and laws. You'd be shocked how many spirit-filled churches that don't believe in the rapture. You'd be shocked how many spirit-filled churches don't believe in heaven or hell. 95% of all Americans believe in heaven, but only 4% believe in hell. Why? Because they're being told there's a heaven if you get saved, but if you don't get saved, don't worry about poof, you're gone. That's not true. And to think to change times and laws, they'll tell people the Lord's not coming. They'll try to change God's word and they shall be given into his hand until a time, a time and a divining time. The three and a half years of the great tribulation period that the Antichrist is going to be really bad. But this activity has already been gone. Notice, he shall wear out the saints. That word wear there, and completely throughout the entire Old Testament, never refers to physical. It's always mental and emotional. Now, no doubt, if the enemy gets you wore out enough in your mind and emotionally, it will wear you out physically. How many have ever been so depressed or so anxious or had anxiety? How many, let me see your hands, where it just wore you, slap out, tuck away your health, your vitality. It was hard to get out of bed. But notice what the devil's going to do. Notice what the Antichrist, read the verses prior to this for your homework assignment. This is how the Antichrist spirit is going to work in the end times. And if you let him get away with it, he will kill you and it will kill you. He will wear out the saints of the most high in their minds. That word wear means our minds 
and our emotions. He said, the way the devil is going to come again. Now I understand why I've been through the stuff in the last couple of years that I've been through mentally and emotionally. Why people I respect and highly look up to have been through what they've been through mentally and emotionally. It's not Sister Jeannie because they're bad or they're not good Christians. It's because they're saints. And what the devil's trying to do is wear us out so that we won't make a stand that we you listen to what I'm trying to say. So if we get so tired, I hear it everywhere I go, Brother Dale. What's the use of trying to stand up against abortion? There's nothing we can do about it. What's the use of trying to stand up against gay marriage? There's nothing we can do about it. That's exactly what the devil wants you to think, that there's nothing that you can do about it. But I'm here to tell you, Brother Daniel showed us there's something you can do about it. You can start seeking the face of God three times a day, and God will send revival. So we know that the attack of the devil, how many can be honest? Let me see your hands. Has the enemy attacked your mind and, with, and try to wear it out emotionally and mentally? See, you're a spirit. Your spirit man can't get any more saved, but your soul is your mind and your emotions. Whatever happens in your mind and your emotions will determine what you do with your flesh. Even though you may not backslide, you may get so wore out that you don't get involved like you used to. You don't go to church like you used to. You, you just say, what's the use? You get so tired of fighting. Be not weary in well-doing. So what does God say? How many believe anything the devil does to stop us, God has a plan to make us more than a conqueror? How many believe we got to do our part? In Romans chapter 12, voice 1 and 2, someone throw your hands up and give the Lord a hand. I'm timing this, but your life depends on it. There is no doubt this is exactly what the Antichrist spirit's doing. And he's trying to wear out those who are saints that are committed so that we don't stand up against those that are changing laws and times and the very person of God. And, the, and he says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, this is the apostle Paul. I'm assuming most of you attend the church of God and, and I'm not, I don't, I, I preach everywhere the door opens. They let me in, I'm going to preach. And, and listen to what I'm saying. But imagine if Mark Williams, the general overseer, came here tonight. Imagine if T.D. Jakes or whatever, or Joyce Myers or someone you really admire. Could you imagine if the general overseer, Brother Dale, of the Church of God came and preached tonight and he dropped down on his knees and said, I beg you, I'm begging you. Listen to me. This is the apostle Paul. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. He is the writer of most of the New Testament, Hank. And this is so serious to him. He's pleading to the church. This great mighty man of God is pleading with the church and he uses the most powerful word available to his vernacular. And he says, I beg you, I beg you. That word beseech means beg. He says, I beg you therefore brethren, by the mercies of God, if you've messed up, fessed up. If you've done something wrong, God's not convicting you to cast you away. It's not condemnation, it's conviction. But what I'm saying to you is how God's mercy can be manifest in your life to give you victory. He said, I beg you, brethren, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as, see, although God wants us to be victorious, when we become saved, he says, you are more than conquerors. This victory does not just automatically happen because we're saved. We're going to heaven. My spirit man can't get any more saved than what it is. It's as saved as a spirit as anybody can be, but my soul needs to be changed and my body needs to be crucified daily. And so he says, present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In part, you've already done that tonight. Notice the next voice. And be not conformed to this world. Don't be conformed. Everybody says, Brother John, if you just shut up, we know how you feel about seeker friendly. Just shut up. Don't say nothing. Don't get involved. Keep it to yourself. You'll be more popular. Yes, I would be more popular with people, but I'd be in serious trouble with God. Why? What does it say here, Brother Dale? It says, and be not conformed to this world. You see, the problem with seeker-friendly doctrine 
is we're trying to make Jesus like us instead of conforming and becoming like Jesus. Be not conformed to this world. There's nothing wrong with holiness. There's nothing wrong with holiness doctrine. That it's important, Josh. We got to have it. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, Brother Tommy, this is awesome. God's saying here, I can transform you, but I can't do it with, and I will not violate your free will. And the only way you can be transformed in your soul and your body, like you've already been in your spirit, is through the renewing of your mind. Without it, it cannot happen that ye may prove what is the good, acceptable, perfect will of God. How many want that? Good, acceptable, perfect will of God. If you want that, give the Lord a hand clap of praise if that's what you want. Now, I'm just going to key here on a word here that's called transformed. That word transformed is the same Greek word that we get the word metamorphosis for. In other words, a change takes place, but it ain't going to be like me coming tonight with a, tomorrow night with a different color shirt, that's a change. I might get a haircut, that's a change. The word metamorphosis means change, but it means that once the change takes place, you cannot go back to the original form. In other words, the best example for this would be a caterpillar. A caterpillar starts out life crawling. Everywhere he goes, he's eating doit. He's got like a thousand little spiny feet that if you ever feel one crawling up your leg, you swear an army of spiders are crawling up to you. Most caterpillars, I frankly have never seen one that was attractive. They have a face only a mother can love. So they're not pretty. They travel by crawling. And um, my son, when he was a little kid, and, and, and he did a, they did an experiment in a school of turning a monarch caterpillars in the monarch butterflies. So I got really into it with him. And we collected all these different caterpillars and we put them in the jaw with the hope that they would make a cocoon and come out a butterfly, a monarch butterfly. Well, you know, in order for that to happen, they got to eat. And the only thing monarch butterflies will eat is milkweed. So I went out cutting milkweed and sticking them in the jaw. And sure enough, sure enough, after a while, they did make a cocoon, all but one of them. And we had all these beautiful cocoons. And I thought to myself, monarch butterflies, Bobby, they come out so beautiful. Maybe I ought to eat some of that stuff. So I went down to the railroad track and I cut me a hunk of milkweed, stuck that in my mouth. <laughs> You're laughing, but I really did it. I, and I bit into it and it was bad. I mean, it was some of the, it was worse than prison food. It was bad. And, and so I thought I must've got a bad batch of milkweed. So I went down to what looked like a better patch of milkweed and I cut me a hunk of that. And I thought, well, maybe it's just the leaves. So I gnawed on the stalk and it never got any better. So if you happen to be born a monarch butterfly, you're not gonna be pretty when you're young. You're gonna crawl on your belly and you're gonna have to eat bitter food all your life until you go in the cocoon. Now, when you go in the cocoon, you stand there for X amount of time that God knows is perfect. And while you're in that cocoon, there's a change taking place. That change is known as a metamorphosis. We know when the metamorphosis is done, y'all, because at the very last few minutes, the cocoon begins to shake violently. My son and I watched it. And then it shakes and it shakes until it splits and, and the little, the monarch butterfly comes out. It's still not too good to look at because its wings are all messed up and stuff. But then it dries out. You know the story. But you see, when you come out, you may have the same genetics you had when you went in physically. But when you come out, you don't crawl anymore. Everywhere you go. You're not disgusting and ugly looking and scary looking. You're so beautiful, people collect you and stick you on their walls. Yeah. And you don't eat bitter milkweed. You get to dine on honey and nectar the rest of your life. You might have started out your life just like I did, a lousy old caterpillar. You might have started crawling. You, might have, you may not have been attractive. You may have been nothing, but God says there's a transformation 
that will take place if you will just give yourself to me and submit your bodies as living sacrifice if you will do your best I will do the rest and when I get done with you when that metamorphosis takes place you're not even going to resemble the one that went in to that cocoon somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise I'm hurrying you talk about a breakthrough y'all you talk about a spiritual breakthrough I'm no longer an ugly caterpillar. I'm no, don't you dare say it. I'm no longer crawling, but I'm flying. I don't have to eat milkweed, Brother Dale, but I get to eat honey and nectar. What a life now. And, and, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a butterfly and, and people don't find me revolting. They, they take pictures of me and, and listen, 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 listen. This sounds a little weird, but it's really what God wants to do. What a, what a, what a breakthrough. See, I'm old enough to remember. I remember on TV, I'm old enough to remember the round TVs with mahogany cabinets, holding the rabbit ears out the window so the rest of the family could watch it. And I remember, I remember them coming on TV. You see, I'm old, I'm old enough to remember these things about medical miracles, medical breakthroughs. Why well, two, I have an uncle and an aunt then until they died, they wore braces on one whole side of their body because when they grew up, polio was a, was a plague in the land. But because of a medical breakthrough, because of a, super, of a medical breakthrough, now we don't have to worry about polio. How many remember, how many got one of those little round scars on your arm? You know why you got that? So you don't get smallpox. But there was a day where smallpox would wipe out practically entire countries but we don't have to worry about that anymore because of a medical breakthrough. I had friends growing up in Chicago. Our, our schools had five, 6,000 kids in them, you know, real Chicago. And, 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 and I grew up and every year, Dale, I knew kids that died from German measles. We don't even think about German measles anymore because of a medical breakthrough. What a wonderful thing God gave us with those breakthroughs. But could you imagine if you had this breakthrough and this metamorphosis took place and you're no longer the person you were when you got saved because a metamorphosis took place in you. See, this person, this person that has been transformed had a metamorphosis. They would be like Christ and they would be immune to bipolarism. They would be immune to depression. They would be immune. Oh, come on, somebody. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I'm preaching this for a reason. But it cannot happen without this giving ourselves as a living sacrifice and it will not happen unless we let God renew our minds through the word guys just because we're saved doesn't mean we're going to be transformed Hank I am tired of being a caterpillar I'm ready to be a butterfly I'm listen I'm saying so how does this work it works through renewing we are transformed through renewing the word renewing means an ongoing continuous process now how do we do this in second corinthians chapter 4 verse 15 through 18 i'm timing myself but this is for your benefit for though ye have ten thousand instructors in christ uh wrong one second corinthians i'm sorry i might have said first let me just read it because you're going to be second corinthians chapter 4 verse 15 through 18 and and it's not your fault it's my fault Oh, there it is. Wow, get the PowerPoint. Now that's thinking fast on your hands, on your feet. Now, now you got to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now we're going to pull that one up in a minute. Can you give me 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 15 through 18? Can you do that real fast or do I, would it be better if I did that? Someone say, who to do that? Someone say, who, should I do that? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Are you ready for this? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15 through voice 18 for all things are for your sakes that the abundance of grace might through thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory of God when we had worship tonight we all come up here bowing the devil would want like to make some of us think we we're just getting emotional getting caught but you see God said as we give we give thanks and we are presenting ourselves as living sacrifice and through the thanksgiving of many we rebound to the glory of God. That word rebound or glory means manifest presence. In verse 16, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. 
for our light affliction is but for a moment, working for us a far more excellent eternal weight of glory, while we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. This is very important because this is the end process of the metamorphosis. The word eternal is used 73 times in the Bible and the word temporal is used once. So our eternal life should be at least 73 times more important to us than this physical life, the temporal life. And through all these afflictions that happen, how many of you have been through a really bad time the last few months? Let me see your hands. This is important for you to understand this because I noticed in that cocoon, Brother Dale, when that final transformation took place, when the cocoon, when the butterfly was ready to come out, something brand new, a changed, transformed, metamorphosed creature, that the cocoon would shake very violently. I did not understand this at the time, so the first one, I cut the cocoon to help the butterfly out, and he came out quicker, but he could never fly. He would flap his wings, but he could never get off the ground. I asked the science teacher, my son's science teacher, I said, why was that? He said, because it's that struggle at the end that gives the strength and the muscle to the butterfly to fly. It looks painful to you, but it's essential for the butterfly. And guys, I'm telling you, when you're in a cocoon and it's tight and it's dark and you feel like you've been cut off and the light afflictions of the flesh and what's going on in your life that seems so overwhelming as we submit ourselves through praise and worship most of the people in this altar praising God tonight are people that are going through real problems that have real needs but something magnificent was taking place because as you are praising God you are shaken inside that cocoon that thing that problem those circumstances that seem to isolate you from the world that makes your life look so dark as you are praising God you begin to shake that cocoon begin to crack and tear and out comes a monarch butterfly oh saints of God you may be going through a difficult time right now but God says if you'll give yourself to me as a living sacrifice if you'll begin to praise me I'm going to take you through this and I'm going to renew you and I'm going to transform you and God somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise Now bear with me, it's an ongoing process. In Colossians chapter three, verse 10, notice what it says here. Do we got that one? Give our PowerPoint team a hand. There's a lot of scripture. Colossians three and 10, do we got that? Do we? Yes, yes. If we just go ahead and give them a hand right now as they pull that up. It's okay. I'm just gonna do it the old fashioned way. Can I just do it the old-fashioned way? Say, oh, there it is. Now remember, if you're going to be transformed, there's a process. It starts with giving yourself as a living sacrifice. It starts with allowing God to renew your mind. It starts with praising God, even when you're going through something that's painful to your flesh. And though my flesh perish, I'm renewed in Him. Now you have to understand something. It's ongoing and it never stops. And notice in verse number 10, it says, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him. You remember in Romans chapter one, it says that God will take us on a marvelous journey. And if we allow him to renew us, we will be transformed into the perfect will of God, which is acceptable to God. We wanna know what that is. How many wanna know what that is? What does God wanna turn me into? And have put on the new, go back to verse 10, please. Colossians chapter three, verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in a knowledge after the image of him that created him. In Romans chapter one, Sister Kathy, God said it's God's perfect and acceptable will for me to be transformed into something. Now we find out what that, how that transformation takes place in part is by living sacrifice. It takes place in part by how we deal with trials in our life. Does it press us into worshiping God, seeking God? If it does, then that renewing continues to go on. And he says, and put on the new man, which is in renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now guys, that's very important because that word renewed there means renovation, remodeling. How many of you need a little remodeling? I do. 
But notice, notice what it says. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. In other words, by the word of God, through this transformation, through a series of things, which I'm going to share quickly as I can, there's a renewing going on continuously. And the end process is to look like the one that created me, to be like Jesus, body, soul, and spirit. A spirit that has a soul that lives in the body. Now, now this is powerful, saints. That, that, that's when you're renewed in the knowledge and image of him, that renewing takes place continuously. It's ongoing. And guys, uh, and, 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 and look what it says, in knowledge after the image of him. If you're a mom or dad out there and you told your kids never to use the word stupid, kids, plug your ears and don't listen to what I'm saying. But do you know the word stupid is in the dictionary? And the word stupid means, and I'm not calling anybody stupid, someone who's ignorant is not stupid. Someone who's ignorant doesn't have the information to make good decisions. Someone is, that is called stupid, according to the Webster, is someone that knows what to do, but doesn't do it. And the Bible says that we can only be renewed by studying the one that we wanna be like, and then yielding ourselves as living sacrifice to the Holy Spirit, and during a, oh, somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise and a shout of triumph. Now, now, this is where the Holy Ghost comes in. If you'll turn now to 2 Corinthians 3, 15 through 18. So when you hear about, when you hear the word of God, your spirit man, everybody say my spirit man is just like Jesus. But my soul, my mind has to be renewed. The Bible says ongoing, continuous. And my flesh has to be crucified every day. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. The, the people of God, that Moses' day did not understand the glory of God. They feared the glory of God. And they said, Moses, you just go in. We don't even want to mess with this stuff. We're just glad to stand here on the edge and you just go on in. This one's saying. But we have much better today. Notice verse 16. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, or they turn to the Lord, when Israel will turn to the Lord, which will happen at fullness when he comes back and splits the Mount of Olives. Nevertheless, when they shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Notice verse 17. Now the Lord is that spirit. And without the spirit of God, you can get the word of God in your mind. All you can just, and when that's where you got to do it, you got to continue to get the word. But what happens in these altars, the manifestation of the Holy Ghost, you cannot be transformed without it. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Notice verse 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in the glass, the glory, the word glory means manifest presence of God, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. So the Bible says that the word of God wants to change me into the very image of Christ, the one that created me. And then as I get in God's presence and I allow the Holy Ghost to touch me over and over and over again, each and every time from glory to glory, from glory to glory, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the the spirit of the Lord. How many of you believe if that change took place in you, you'd have a mind that would be immune to depression. You'd have a mind that would be immune to buy someone give the Lord a hand clap of praise. So God's goal and God's perfect and acceptable will for every one of us is to have the perfect mind of Christ Therefore, our flesh will follow. That is God's perfect will. There's no doubt about it for everybody in this room, but there's a little bit more. Now, bear with me. I know it's hooky joiky, but I'm timing myself and I'm gonna stay within that limit. But notice Ephesians chapter four, verse 23 here. And being renewed in the spirit of your mind. The Bible says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, even cutting asunder the soul and the spirit. In other words, your spirit, man, and your soul, your mind and your emotions are so closely connected that only the word of God can cut it apart without harming you. That's how close connected it is. And guys, I'm telling you something, saints. If, if, if you ever get sick in your spirit, 
if you if you ever if you ever allow your get to that place where you get o- overcome with grief or overcome with sorrow it's it's bad and it can it can get in your spirit and if it gets in your spirit if it gets a hold of your spirit that heaviness put on a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness you have to have supernatural intervention and that aren't you glad that even if that heaviness had somehow got into your spirit man that there's still an answer why because jesus said i came to heal the brokenhearted that had nothing to do with a heart attack it has to whenever the bible refers to the heart it refers to the spirit of man and even if your spirit man has gotten sick through discouragement and through problems that we have a jesus that came to heal the brokenhearted somebody give the lord a hand clap of praise I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying, but it's going to be worth the payoff. Somebody th- throw your hands up and say, it's worth the payoff. Because I'm going to tell you something. This renewing does not just take place automatically. It takes place through the renewing of our mind. Now, now, if you would, go to John chapter 15, verse 3. The word here says, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. That word clean there means to be clean it means to be pure it means to be clear for some of us to get a renewed mind god has to take out of our minds things that we allowed in there somebody while you were in sin and i'm not judging anyone but when you're in sin you you may have exposed yourself to pornography some of you may have experienced the horrible of being raped or molested some of you have gone through some horrific things and for your emotions and your mind to be renewed there has to perhaps be some memories taken out there has to be a cleansing us how many of you have ever noticed if you ever look at the wrong thing it's far better to not look at it in the first place because once you do it it's real hard to get it out of your head but god says i got an answer for that too now you are clean through the word how many of you know that the Holy Spirit from glory to glory can take the word of God and clean those things out of your mind that are holding you back right now? Take out those painful memories. Take out those times. Oh, somebody give the Lord a hand clap. I can take the stuff out. Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Notice, notice now Ephesians 5.26. I know it's hoiky joiky, but bear with me that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word. He's talking here, Paul's talking about the church, and he's saying that Christ cleansed the church through the washing of the water of the word. Well, the church is not a building or an organization. It's you and I, the body of Christ. And God says the word of God from glory to glory, someone lift up your hands right now. You're not going to leave here like you came. God's going to do it. How many are tired of having that same old battle going on in your head and going on in your emotions? How many want God to renew you and change you and transform you into somebody? Listen to this. That he may sanctify, make pure, make holy, and cleanse with the washing of the water of the word. There are people today, I don't know why, that are afraid of the Holy Ghost. There are people that attend Pentecostal churches that are horrified of the Holy Ghost, but the word in itself will not renew you. It will not transform you. It is the word of God working together with the Holy Spirit, with the water, the Holy Ghost, and the water is the Holy Spirit, and out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water that he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word of God as we come to an altar and yield to the Holy Spirit that Holy Spirit like a river of living water begins to flow through us takes that very word that God just gave us and cleanses us with it renews us with it would somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise now we're going to skip 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 we're going to go right to Romans chapter 8 verse 6 for to be carnally minded. See, the devil's main attack, the Antichrist spirit, was to wear out the saints in their minds <coughs> and their emotions. If he does, it's quite deadly. You see, to be carnally minded is death. 
but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. This is very important. So I'm going to read to you some definitions because the English just doesn't do the Greek word justice. The word mind there means purpose. What do you purpose in your mind? How do you purpose to use your mind? It means inclination. You know, the way you lean, how you turn. It means to exercise. It means to entertain. What thoughts do you entertain? What do you think about the most? It means affections. What are you affectionate of? In other words, to be carnally minded, that's what the word minded means, is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The word life there means quickened through glory and rhema or the word of God. The word peace means prosperity, quietness, rest, and peaceable. In other words, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is prosperity, peace, and quietness. If my mind is set and has the right, are you hearing what I'm trying to say to you, saints? This, this is so important because many Christians are struggling because they think it's just going to happen automatic and there's no effort on their part. There's great effort on your part, but it's worth it. Anybody out there got a degree? You had to go to school a long time to get that degree. Well, it's the same thing with the word of God. When you become a disciplined one, you get a degree and, oh God, listen to this. But why is this so important? Because to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life. If you approach everything in your life from the natural, carnality is not necessarily sin. When I go back to the motel room tonight, I'm going to take a shower. How many are glad I'm going to take a shower? The way I sweat, I shave. That's an act of carnality. If my wife's there, I'm going to kiss her. I have paperwork and it's perfectly legal. Then I'm, you, 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 that's carnal. That ain't going to get me to heaven. It may make me feel like I'm in heaven, but... I'm trying to explain something. Carnality isn't just sin. If you approach everything in your life carnally minded, if you approach your health carnally minded, it will be very difficult for you to get healed. When people sit in churches and, 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 they're, not, and they're carnally minded and not spiritually minded, when an offering's being received, their first thought is, oh, they're trying to get my money. They're trying to take my money. But the spiritually minded person is saying, man, I'm sowing seed. I'm investing in the kingdom. In other words, God says, you got to renew your mind. It's not about me going out and committing sin. Gerald, you and I, we're not going to go out and commit sin. But he said, you cannot be carnally minded in anything that comes to anything you need spiritually because carnally minded is death but if you'll be spiritually minded when you get sick you see yourself healed when you're spiritually minded when you're going through a battle you see a victory you cannot oh somebody shout hallelujah oh somebody shout hallelujah somebody shout hallelujah <laughs> now I'm going to close I'm going to close pretty quick <laughs> James chapter 1, verse 8. We're going to skip 5. Let's go right to verse 8. A double-minded man. No, let's go to verse 7 and 8. Can we go to 7 and 8? For let not that man, it says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He's tossed like a wave. For let not that man think that he received anything of the Lord. If you're double-minded. Why? Now, I know that you want your miracle or you wouldn't be here. I know you want to grow in God or you wouldn't be here. I know that you want to live with freedom in your mind and your emotions or you wouldn't be here. Then why don't we get it, Pastor? Because the Bible says if a man is double-minded, he's unstable in all of his ways and he's tossed and turned like a wave. For let not that man think he receive anything of the Lord. Notice verse 8. Our minds are very important. Notice verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Do you know why you can't get nothing from the Lord if you're double-minded? you know what the word double-minded means? It means to be of two opinions. It means to be of two spirits. Listen to what I'm saying, since I know it's taking a little time. If I'm of two opinions too long, what happens is I will soon be of two spirits. Now, it's bad enough if that second spirit, the one spirit's God and the other one is the spirit of man that's bad because I can't get anything supernatural and that's death but what if that other thing where I'm double minded or of two opinions 
allows demons in my life. And now I'm not just two-spirited, God and flesh, but it's God and demons. You see, let not that man think he received anything of God. See, we've got to get in God's word. We've got to be hungry for God's word because what's happened, the reason why the church is so messed up and there's so, so many people commit killing themselves and having to take all these meds just to get by is because we're too carnally minded. And what's happening is, is that we're being controlled by our carnal self, which doesn't see healing. It doesn't see deliverance. It doesn't see the perfect will of God it is to make me just like Jesus. How many know that Jesus has victory over everything? How many know that Jesus has victory over all things? Now I'm going to close right now. You got a lot of word tonight. And tomorrow night I'll make sure that I give the scriptures correctly where I don't put these gentlemen on the spot. But God gave me a word for you that guarantees victory. Someone that wants guaranteed victory tonight, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. And someone say, as of tonight, I'm going to come to church every night. I'm going to give myself as a living sacrifice. That's where it's got to start. Then I'm going to get into God's word and I'm going to start doing what it says because that's the only thing that can change my thinking. And thinking changes my actions. And then you see when the Holy Ghost gets a hold of me, someone throw your hands up and say, I'm going to let the Holy Ghost get a hold of me because when I let the Holy Ghost get a hold of me, he gets hold of the word I heard that night and he performs it in my life. From glory to glory, I'm changed into the image of the one I worship. If you want to look like Jesus, you can't get there unless you experience the Holy Ghost. Someone give the Lord a hand clap of praise. We're going to close. Just one more verse. This is the guaranteed slam dunk. One more verse. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. For your homework assignment, how many will go home and read the first three verses of chapter 4, 1 John 4? It's talking about the Antichrist. The same thing that Daniel talked about. Now, this is post-Calvary. And God says, ye are of God, little children. Ye are of God, little children and have overcome them. Everybody raise your hand and say, I might've been through a battle lately, but I belong to God. I'm God's child. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise if you're God's child? If you're God's child. Praise him, get ready. You are God, little children. Isn't that comfortable when you're struggling, when you're going through an attack in your mind to hear God the Father say, you're my child. You're my child. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Do you know what God is saying here? Brother Russell, God is saying here that the Jesus that's in you and I right now is greater than the Antichrist will be at the fullness of of his power that the Jesus that's in you and I right now is greater than the Antichrist that's going to have world domination very soon the Jesus that's in us is greater than the Antichrist spirit will be at the height of his power somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise somebody give the Lord a shout of triumph greater is he that is in you I said greater is he that is in you I said greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world Jesus that's in you right now is is greater already than the antichrist spirit in this world at his fullness of power and if you run to this altar and just begin to praise and magnify God as we pray for you tonight that Holy Ghost from glory to glory from glory is going to take the word of God and transform you into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise Please stand to your feet all across this room. There you go. There you go. I'm glad they taped this message tonight. Come here, sissy. Come here. Pastor, the enemy says, the Lord of God says, that one of the greatest attacks against the saints, the committed folks, is he's going to try to wear them out in their minds. That word wear never applies to the flesh. It's the minds and the emotions. Because if he can get you there, he can stop you from becoming the image of Christ right now. Jesus never knew defeat.
many of you have been going through an attack in your minds and your emotions? Let me see your hands. When you come here to this altar, as you come up, I want you to come out of your pews and just throw your hands in the air and begin to praise God. And as you do, you're presenting yourself as a living sacrifice. And the very word that you heard preached tonight can now be performed in you by the Holy Spirit. Now listen to me. And then a tremendous metamorphosis will take place. It is God's perfect will to make you as much like Jesus as you can be before the rapture. That person would be immune to depression. That person would have victory over sickness and disease by the renewing. In the name of Jesus, I make you new, greater. power